If you love liberty, declare your independence by signing the Shire Society Declaration at shiresociety.com. All right, our next speaker is Vin Armani. He is the founder and CTO of Cointext, and he is going to be talking about the pilgrimage to Porkfest. So please help me welcome Vin Armani. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you, guys, for being here. So, uh, yeah, this, this talk today is inspired uh, by my experience with Porkfest. This, over the last, this is my third Porkfest. My first one that I attended was basically the, uh, the catalyst for me deciding to move my family to New Hampshire. The second one that I attended last year uh, ended up conceiving my second child here at Porkfest. So I think that that's, that's actually, you get a lot of uh, March and April birthdays, and it seems like uh, that's a common occurrence. Uh, I've started calling it the pork stork, and Rachel Goldsmith is one of them. There's a, there's a few others. Uh, and with that, uh, I, because we had small children, have moved back to the West Coast uh, in the last several months be closer to family, my, uh, my mother wanting, of course, to be close to the kids, and then we'll be coming back uh, shortly and probably in a couple of years when they get a little older and we don't need the help. Uh, but in coming this year, uh, it, really, it, it really was a, a time of reflection for me and seeing that of all of the different events that I attend and speak at, Porkfest stuck out in my mind as being particularly important, something that uh, I felt a, a intense and deep need to attend. And I've never, I've also not ever gone to an event that uh, made me want to travel and move and move my family at, uh, at great expense because of that event. And so in thinking about that, I wanted to, and in, in meditating about it, um, I, I've actually come to realize that this may not be by accident. And so I would like throughout this for you guys to keep an open mind. I'm going to give you a theory that you can internalize and maybe walk around with this theory as you are uh, moving through Porkfest this year and see if, it, see if it perhaps doesn't hold up for you. So how many people here are, raise your hand if you are not a New Hampshire native. You were not born or raised in New Hampshire. Pretty much everybody not born. Oh, keep them up, keep them up, keep them up. Hold on. It's, it's me as well. It's me as well. Uh, put your hand down if you, uh, you moved to New Hampshire without having ever attended a Free State Project event. Put your hand down. So without, so you moved without attending an event? You as well? I'm just trying to figure this out. So you had attended an event, you had attended an event. Okay. So what we are, what for me, the, the time of coming here to Porkfest, I, I really, I think my first experience was, I, I would say almost a, almost a religious experience. I had a very interesting experience with being a life, lifelong libertarian, at least in my uh, adult years, but never having really been in an environment where people were doing liberty in the way that people are doing it here. And so what I want to talk about is, and what I've meditated on, come on, there we go. Asking myself the question, well, what are you doing at Porkfest? And I'd like you guys to start with this question. What are you doing at Porkfest? Get in your mind. What you think you're doing here? Well, how, whatever that question means to you. And I'm going to ask you this question. Are you sure? Are you sure of what you are doing? So if we're going to talk about moving forward, liberty in our lifetime, but hopefully liberty even past that, moving into the future, I want to talk about the future of Porkfest. I want to talk about the present, and I'm going to take us on a journey into the past because there is a deep connection to what we are doing here today that most of us probably don't even realize. And of course, the future depends on what we believe right now. But what we believe right now really depends on what we understand about our past, both our past as individuals, 
a shared past culturally. And there's also another concept, this idea that before you can articulate a concept, before you can talk to someone else about it, especially before you can really be considered a master of something, you have to have first fully embodied that concept. And so I'm sure there are people in this audience who are experts in their field. But the difference between an expert and a master is really can you teach someone else? And if you've ever tried to teach someone something that you're an expert in, it doesn't matter whether it's some athletic pursuit, whether, uh, you know, marksmanship, there's a lot of things going on, whether it's cooking, teaching your children to do things, you know, you often have to say, well, okay, well, what is it that I'm doing? Even if it's as simple as tying your shoe, right? We, we've embodied it so much that we don't think about it. We can do it driving. But when you want to teach somebody something, you have to think, well, what is it that I'm doing? So that you can take that information and pass it forward. You have to examine all of your activities that you've taken for granted to be able to articulate it and pass it forward. And that's really the difference between an expert at something and a master. And of course, the word master, maestro in Spanish, is the same word for master and teacher. They're the exact same word. And the Latin root, it's the exact same word, master, teacher. When they refer to Jesus in, uh, in the New Testament as master, when his disciples call him master, they're saying teacher. So, keeping those two in mind, does anybody know why today... June 21st, 2019, is special to all of humanity. Bet you didn't know that. Some of you didn't know that. Does anybody know? Yell it out if you know. It's an auspicious... See? What are we doing? So, today is the summer solstice. Now, the sun is just coming out. Today happens to be the longest day of the year. And the summer solstice, think of it, now think about that just for one second, that I asked that. I asked that and got no response. What are we doing? Here we are, gathered together. I'm up here speaking about this, and it's the summer solstice. For those who don't know what the summer solstice is and why this happens, it's the longest day of the year today, meaning it's the longest sunlight. Correct. Very good. So, of course, the world turns on its axis. Well, let's put it like this. The summer solstice is always the longest day of the year. Down south, it's the winter solstice right now. Right? So their summer solstice is our winter solstice, which will be around December 21st. Sun spins on its axis, uh, excuse me, the Earth spins on its axis. Got a little bit of a tilt. And that means that for half of the year, it's going this way. The sun right now is overhead of the Tropic of Cancer. Way north, in the North Pole, the sun is not going to set today. Got the land of the midnight sun. And the exact opposite, as he said, down in the Southern Hemisphere. This is super important for telling time. This is the, 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 this is the moment that really you could say history starts. Without this, it's, it's, human history is not the same. Right now there are a ton of people gathered at Stonehenge in England. Stonehenge, this is summer solstice, the sun rising between those pillars. That's the beginning of the Celtic New Year. People built this. One of the reasons they built it was to figure out when is the summer solstice. You stand in a certain place, the sun looks like it comes up right between that and it's been doing so for thousands of years. So there's England. This is the Ajanta Temple in India. Summer solstice. The sun comes through a window. These are caves, actually, carved out of the rock. Specially aligned for summer solstice, the equinox. On summer solstice, the, the sun comes in and hits that Buddha right there, just on that day. So they knew when was the summer solstice. Look small Mexico. This is the Pyramid of the Magician. It is aligned... This stairway is perfectly aligned so that on sunset, on the summer solstice, it lights up. We've got 
Chaco Canyon, New Mexico. This is called the Sun Dagger. You can kind of see the petroglyph of a winding sun. And on the summer solstice, it perfectly brackets that beginning of their year. So all of these beginnings. Ohio, this is the Serpent Mound in Ohio. This is maybe over 2,000 years old. They know for sure it's 1,000 years old, but they found charcoal in there that's over 2,000 years for, that they've dated it. The sun sets, you can kind of see you've got that same whirl. There's a whole bunch of astronomical symbols in here, but on the summer solstice, the sun sets into the serpent's mouth. You can see it's kind of like a snake there. That's in Ohio. Uh, the, this is in Easter Island. All of these are aligned. This is the largest platform with these moai. There's 15 giant moai that are there. They're all aligned looking at the setting sun on the summer solstice. Miyoto Iwa, this is in Japan. These two rocks, on summer solstice, the sun uh, rises exactly in between the two. They're called the Merry Couple Rocks. If you stand in a particular place, beginning of the year for those people as well. And of course, the pyramids of Egypt. If you're standing at the Sphinx, the sun setting on summer solstice is exactly between those two pyramids. So, summer solstice was incredibly important to the Egyptians because you can barely make it out there, but there's a, that's the star Sirius rising about two weeks after the summer solstice when Sirius rose at the same time as the sun and they could see Sirius, the Nile would flood. And that was the beginning of their year. Interestingly enough, two weeks from the summer solstice, Anybody do the calculation? About 14 days from now? Fourth of July. Fourth of July. Of course, we've got uh, at least eight that we know about, perhaps 30 of the signers of the Declaration of Independence, which was signed on July 4th, or Masons. You've got the long history coming from Egypt. And what do we do on the fourth of July? Fireworks up in the sky, look at the star, they're serious. That was the beginning of their year, it was the beginning of this country. Something beginning, new beginnings. This is what it has meant for thousands upon thousands of years. So now we get into what have people done as this expanded out. The Greeks, the Olympics, the summer solstice was the one month countdown to the Olympics. Everybody from all of Greece getting together, celebrating their Greekness in a very Greek way. <laughs> and it's not like it's not being embodied here. This was marketing for this year's Porkfest. Here's the sunrise, here's the sunset. The exact times, letting you know it's a long, come enjoy the long summer days. Now, I'm not saying that whoever made that was even thinking, oh, summer solstice, that's important. People have been doing this for a very long time. I'm saying it's embodied. I'm saying we don't even necessarily realize that we're doing it, but we've been doing it for so damn long that it just sort of creeps in. Even down to our lovely little mascot. I mean, if that's not an animal carrying the sun on his back, I don't know what it is. Porcupine Freedom Fest, Pork Fest, symbolized by a little animal that looks like half a sun during the summer solstice that's been celebrated by people for thousands of years coming together, maybe there's something more going on here. So what are you doing at Porkfest? What are we doing here? And maybe more importantly, now that we've started to realize that there might be more going on, that at the very least, there's an energy 
or an idea or the potential. Maybe we've just stumbled onto something as human beings sometimes do. Maybe we've just stumbled onto something, but now we can understand what we're doing and maybe we can use that as a tool since it's been so successful in bringing cultures together throughout history. Maybe we can start looking at Porkfest a little bit differently and bringing more people into the fold. So, second part of this. Something I say to my daughter all the where do you think you're going? <laughs> Parents know this, where do you think you're going? And this is what got me thinking about this talk in the first place. So you're traveling to Porkfest. Now you know what you're doing. Where do you think you're going? Oop. So this is uh, a picture that's depicting the Canterbury Tales, which is Geoffrey Chaucer is considered perhaps one of the first pieces of literature in the English vernacular as we understand it. It's a series of stories that are told amongst these pilgrims who are all traveling to Canterbury, which is, uh, I, I actually just on the way here, found out that Canterbury is the place where uh, Roman Catholicism sort of first had its first mission and how it spread. There was cult, uh, Celtic Christianity in the British Isles, but this is how Roman Catholicism spread. Canterbury is still the seat of the uh, Church of England. These are people traveling on a pilgrimage. And one of the cool things about Canterbury Tales with Chaucer is that you see from knights to paupers, all of these people traveling together, for every strata traveling together and telling stories reveling in their Britishness, bringing themselves together. That's the idea of the Canterbury Tales. This is Cumella. This is actually the largest pilgrimage uh, in terms of population. Hundreds of millions of people. Four, every four years. This is, uh, you probably heard of this. This is people going to bathe in the Ganges in India. Very, very important if you're someone of Indian descent that this is something that you might do one time in your life. It's not the largest yearly. That's actually in Karbala. Uh, Arba'in, it's called. This is a, uh, a Shiite Muslim pilgrimage. It's supposed to be traveled on foot. They have up to 20 million people that will show up every single year. But perhaps the most uh, well-known that is still in existence, that is, I think, crucially important to take as an example is the Hajj to Mecca. This is one of the five pillars of Islam, something that every Muslim is supposed to do at least one time in their life, uh, is to travel, it's a, curiously enough, five days. Pilgrimage and a five day experience. Workfest is five days. Now this doesn't take place on the summer solstice, but it's got the right timing. The Hajj is so impactful, talking about religious experiences. This is a, a really cool letter uh, that Malcolm X, when he went on the Hajj in 1964, com it completely changed who he was. He said, uh, this is a letter that he wrote back to sort of his, his friends and his, his aides in the States. He said, you may be shocked by these words coming for, from me, but on this pilgrimage, what I have seen and experienced has forced me to rearrange much of my thought patterns previously held and to toss aside some of my previous conclusions. He basically goes on to say, I no longer think white people are the devil. And as a matter of fact, I, I really don't think that even separation of the races in the way that I've even been teaching it is correct. Because I've come here and I've experienced guys, blonde hair, blue eye, treating me as a brother. It's that, that experience of the pilgrimage, the idea that here we can come to a sacred place where everybody's doing that thing, where everybody's being the best, let's say, Muslim that they could be where everybody's being the best Indian that they could be, where everybody's being the best British person that they could be on their uh, travel to Canterbury. So, now with the question of, what are we doing at Porkfest? 
And what could we be doing? Or what maybe could we be thinking that we are doing as we are here? We're here already. To be that sort of being, this is only 15 years old. All of the, uh, I mean, we're talking about the first Taj was basically in 630 AD. So yeah, now it looks like that. But, what are we doing? We're doing all of those things that are the, let's say, the sacred rituals of liberty. In a compressed amount of time, all of us together, whether it's embracing the free market, defending ourselves, learning from our elders, Jeffrey's not that old, you know what I mean, but, <laughs> of course, uh, exploring new financial paradigms, and then just simply having the communion of other liberty lovers. And so, here's what we, here's what I think we actually are doing. And I think that we're extending something that human beings have been doing for a very long time. And I think that if we want to see liberty in our lifetime, if we want to see the spread of libertarianism, that we have an opportunity to take something, this thing, that is a tool, and if we change our minds about what it is and how we're using it, that it can potentially be that thing that puts the movement together. There's a reason why the Hajj is one of the five pillars of Islam. So you've got making the uh, profession of the faith. Okay, makes sense. You've got prayer. You've got uh, giving of alms to the poor. And then you've got going on a, a trip somewhere. Everybody's got to do it. Why do they have to do it? Because it's going to change you. It's gonna change your understanding about what it is to be a Muslim, just in the same way that even my first pork fest experience, and I think that this is probably true for a lot of people, change your understanding of what it means to be a libertarian. I was asked just recently in a, a, an interview, uh, the guy was skeptical of my beliefs said, well, have you ever lived in an anarchist society? This is just like a, a week ago. And I said, well, I'm on my way to pork fest. But really, it, it seems a little frivolous, but it's the truth. We have to, you have to have a prototype of what your society is gonna look like in the first place. You have to be able to embody it before you can take it out and live it all the time. You gotta do it one day first, or five, every year, and to come back and to re-cement it so we're making a deep and profound connection with our ancestors. Whether we know it or not, we are gathered today. You can, you can say whatever you want to say, you can be skeptical about everything that I've said, but you are sitting here, gathered among people who are ideologically aligned with you on the summer solstice. That has been going on with humans of every cultural background for thousands of years. So there's something happening, or is it just coincidence? That just today, this talk happens to be on so It's just coincidence, I'm sure. You're sacrificing your time and expense to make a pilgrimage to a sacred site. One of the interesting things about coming to this particular location is that even for most free staters, it's not all that convenient. You gotta put in some work, you gotta plan. You're gonna be camping, it's gonna be rustic. And that's so similar, so, so similar to all of the pilgrimages that have stuck around. Canterbury Tales, these people are on the road, they're camping out as they make their pilgrimage. It's the same thing. Connecting with those of like-minded heart to participate in the sacred rituals of liberty. That's all that we're doing here. And the more you take, the more you take advantage of it, the better. I think the most important part is this. Passing on a sacred tradition to future generations. This is one of the few libertarian conferences that is like absolutely bring your family. 
Absolutely. And you see, of all generations, little kids, and it's really, I think, it's one of the best parts about Porkfest, is that the children are here, and they get to see this. From the beginning, it's normalized. So liberty in our lifetime, maybe it expands out a little further than that. Maybe this is the experience of liberty in our lifetime. It's got to start one day before it can be 365. And as we have new generations of porcupines that come up, eventually some of them are going to leave the nest. New Hampshire's a small state. They may go away to school, job, meet somebody, but there's always this time to come back, to reconnect with your extended family, with the larger community. And I think that it should be something that we have in the back of our mind when we talk to other libertarians. That we stress, well, have you been to Porkfest? Well, are you coming this year? And to when we communicate it to them in a way that it is a pilgrimage. Have you experienced it? You could talk the talk, but here's the opportunity to walk the walk. And so I think, I think that just changing our minds a bit and experimenting with this thought as you look around that it, you may be participating in something bigger. Moving it forward and communicating that same thing with individuals. We have a really awesome opportunity here. Perhaps we've stumbled onto it. As I say, perhaps we have. That doesn't make it any less valuable. That you stumble onto something that's incredibly powerful is, is also great. I don't think we've stumbled onto it. I think we're onto something. And it's also good to see people that I, that I haven't seen in a couple years here. So perhaps there is something even greater going on. Perhaps there's even a reset button. So it's something very powerful. I think that we should be, uh, we should be proud of it. We should embrace what we've got. And, uh, and that's it for me today. So thank you guys. And if there's any questions, I'm happy to take them. Thank you, Vin, an amazing talk so far. But before we get to questions, uh, I just have to make an announcement. Uh, so the wells are all dry in this area. So we are on a temporary, we have to wait for the wells to catch up. So temporary water emergency, no non-emergency use of the water until the, uh, the emergency is over. So I apologize, but thank you. Yeah, okay, Ian, go ahead. So uh, Vin, when are you moving back? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, this is definitely home for me, for sure. Uh, I've, never, I've never been in a place that I felt as at home. Um, I would say, I would say probably, I mean, I've got a three-year-old now. I would say within the next probably three years, I'll be back. Um, I really don't, well, I'm, I'm in California. I really don't want them to go to school in California. Uh, so I'm going to, I'm going to push this off onto my, uh, my wife and my mother and, uh, taking advantage of the fact that I can pretty much work from anywhere and uh, allowing grandma to have time with the little, the little new one who's uh, just three months old now. So I didn't want to deny her that, but I will be back, it's home. this is home for me. Hmm? No? Okay, all right, thank you guys. <laughs> Thank you very much, Vin, for that uh, amazing talk. And um, as a Californian myself that moved to New Hampshire, I, I understand how difficult it could be to move all the way uh, across the country, uh, leaving a lot of your friends and family behind. But, um, I mean, yeah, oh, yeah, I get you. And uh, he said he did it twice. Um, um, but yeah, and uh, uh, I, I, one of the great things, like you mentioned, is you, you make so many new friends and family here, uh, both uh, free staters and non-free staters. So um, it's it's a very easy uh, process to do once you uh, uh, once you are able to uh, kind of make make this place your home. You feel like it's home. We'd like to invite you to visit freekeen.com. 
FreeKeen.com features audio, video, and blogs chronicling the transition to a voluntary society. FreeKeen.com also has comments and discussion forums so you can be heard. FreeKeen.com I should be in Keene, New Hampshire with the Free Staters. <laughs>